me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, the microphone's fixed. I'm going to turn the, the camera around, and you're going to be seeing the class. Yes. Uh, yes. And in just a second, I think I can make you bigger. Hold on a second. You're kind mm -hmm. of tiny on the screen. That's bigger now. Now, just give me a second to see whether we can get St. Croix into our conversation. I'm kind of tiny in life. Yeah, just hang on. There's St. Croix. And now if we push this button, let's see if all of the pieces come together. Hey, St. Croix, can you see this on the screen? Yes. This is Dr. Gail Delaney, ladies and gentlemen, here in St. Thomas and on our campus on St. Croix. Through Skype, you're talking to Gail Delaney in, is it Mill Valley, California? Just north of San Francisco. Just on the other side of the bridge. How far on the other side of the bridge? About, on traffic days, it's about 45 minutes. Without traffic, it's 30 minutes into the middle of town. So 10 so miles. Mount Tam is, you pass Mount Tam on your way up to... I live on Mount Tam, on the north face, lower down, looking back at the city, and I tried to show you a view, but the camera's not good enough. Okay, well, I'm going to turn my camera around, and you can oh, see. Oh, good. Hello, everybody. And this is our class in St. Thomas. Unfortunately, I can't set it up so you can see the class on St. Croix, but you'll have to take my word for it that on St. Croix there is at present one person, and usually four, so we might see the rest of them. Okay. Um, and what I told everybody is that you might tell us a little bit. We're just at the point where we're about to read your chapter in your book. And one of the students in this group has read one of your other books as their reading project. So we're, um, we've, we've read about Ullman and we've read about Freud and we've read about Jung and we've read about Maynard Boss. And Good. they're just about to, the next time we meet, your chapter is the one we're going to be talking about. And that's why I thought it would be a really good idea just to hear you talk about your chapter and your ideas and how you look at doing dreaming. Um, this group has read a bunch of uh, technical material about the brain good. and about synapses and neurochemicals and about sleep free processes and rapid eye movements, all of the usual stuff has all been covered. Okay. Now we're just, we've been looking in the last few weeks at different methods for discussing and examining and interpreting dreams. Okay. And our, our key concept that we keep coming back to, I described to you the other day, the idea that there's a bunch of ideas out there, like coconuts sitting on the countertop, and you pick one up and you look at it and then you put it down again. So let me turn the floor over to you, and after you've gone for a little while, maybe you turn the floor over and we'll have... Students who want to ask questions, come to the microphone. Okay. Deal? All right. It's a deal. Now, Alex, let me just ask you, do people address you as Professor Randall or uh, Dr. Randall or Alex or what? We try for Dr. Alexander Randall the fifth, and that doesn't seem to work very well. I'm sorry about the fifth. I haven't gotten anybody to say that ever. Um, sometimes they, I've got one student who calls me Doc. Uh -huh. I've got some who call me Prof. Uh -huh. A lot who call me Hey You. Uh, and most of the time, most of them just walk into my office and interrupt. I see, I see. Well, I like the fifth because it's so unusual, and I think of the various Henrys and the, the kings of, of, of yore. But Alexander is such a great name, so you're always Alex. So I'll call you Alex if, I, if you don't mind for now, because I'd like to say to all of the students, my name is Dr. Gail Mary Virginia Delaney, and if I'd stayed in the Catholic Church just two more years, I'd have Gail Mary Virginia Gloria Teresa Delaney with the doctor in front. But wow. for short, I, I love names, and I love female names with A's on the ends of them, so I added a lot, but I, oh well. So I'd suggest you all think of me as Gail because we'll be working on interview stuff, you know, how you feel with somebody else and what's going on. I think that's the easiest. If you prefer calling me anything else, take a pick, okay? Uh, so what I'm curious about, uh, you've read chapters one and two of All About Dreams, I gather, in that case. Is that right, Alex? Uh, new Directions in Dream Interpretation is our current textbook. Okay. The, the New Directions book. All right, got it. I had the other tell book us, in mind. Tell us how many books you have. About eight. I have About a, eight. I have a website that describes them, and it's called YourSleepingGenius.com. And all, all one word or hyphens? Oh, all one word. 
All one word, YourSleepingGenius.com. Yes, and that's being transformed into a much more professional site. I made that site, and it shows. But it also shows because it has pretty colors. The new one's going to be modern and white, and I asked a pro to do it because my skills are so limited. So anyway, you'll see that, and it gives you these really long descriptions and pretty color pages um, about each book. But what I was going to suggest, having thought, I'm sorry, I thought you were doing uh, All About Dreams. That book has a chapter, and it's called Chapter 3. And in that chapter, it talks about different methods of dream interpretation, gathering them and grouping them in a way that's not been done before. We think that there's Freud as a method and Jung as a method. and the, Well, Freud and Jung use the same methods. Freud uses an associative method, very rarely, and he uses a psychotheoretical symbol substitution system. He called it that himself. And... That's just what Jung does. He just has different symbols that he substitutes different meanings for. So I would encourage you to take a look. You could probably find it somewhere online. And that chapter three is very helpful to students. As you look at different coconuts, ah, this coconut Freud, he uses associative method and he uses a psychotheoretical symbol substitution method. Jung uses psychotheoretical substitution method. In other words, this dream is an archetype that I've described. This dream is another archetype, and it means that kind of thing in your dream. And the using of myth is the cultural method. Jung uses a lot of the cultural method of dream interpretation. And then there's, do you know about pearls and the gestalt method? Just no, like, just we talked about that just last week. Great, okay. Prince Pearls. Right, very cool stuff. And he uses an emotion-focusing system. That's very interesting, and I use that sometimes. I use sometimes the associative method, um, and then we have the phenomenological method, which is really my home. I didn't know it when I divided, devised my way of working the dreams, but Eric Craig from Santa Fe, New Mexico, said, Gail, did you know you're a phenomenologist existentialist? He said that to me in 1984 at our first Association for the Study of Dreams conference in San Francisco. And he said, you must read Maynard Boss. And that's how I got turned on to Boss. So there are all these marvelous coconuts around, and then you'll choose with time what's most useful for you. I feel strongly about the way I work, or I wouldn't work that way. I'd work some other way. So forgive me for that. That's just how it is. And I'll mention that as we go along. Uh, what I'd love to know is what you're all most curious about right now. Is it, do you want a little overview of what I do with dreams? Or is there something that you've already read that you have some questions about? Let's throw it open to the group. Who's got questions and who would rather hear an overview of Gail's method? You can have both, but it doesn't matter. I've got, I've got one. Well, we can have both. Come talk on the mic. Oh, hear first and ask questions. Okay. I would say brief us on your favorite method. We, we've talked about phenomenology. I made everybody learn how to pronounce it. And <laughs> existentialism. Everybody had to learn how to pronounce that, too. Uh -huh. I and say, if nothing else, when you go to college, you ought to sound like you went to college. That's right. And right. shining forth. You must consider that shining forth of your essential being is a, a pathway to joy, whether you use it in dreams or not. Let yourself shine forth, which Maynard Boss liked to talk about a lot. So he's well, well worth reading. And I always like to shine fifth. <laughs> well, of course you would. <laughs> okay, so, so let's talk about the dream interview method. Uh, when I was in college in 72, is where I, when I graduated, I was very interested in Carl Jung because he seemed so modern. Freud seemed so old-fashioned and so sexist. So I did a Jungian analysis in New York City, tra traveling back and forth an hour by train from Princeton. And I look back on it, I had an absolutely terrible therapist. She thought she was hot stuff, but she also thought she had all the answers. Just one of my big problems with these systems that interpret your dreams for you. Aha, I am the wise man, the old white patriarch, is in fact Germanic, and I have these answers for you because I know how your female mind works, and I know how your male mind works. And being a woman of feminist era, I didn't recognize myself in Jung's description of women as yin-yang, as the yin, moist, passive, receptive, good at feeling but terrible at thinking. Thanks a lot. And then men, of course, were bright, not dark. They were active, not passive.
They were creative and they did thinking very well, but not so good on feeling. My argument is, if you tell a man that his feeling function is feminine, he's going to be a lot less motivated to do feelings. Feelings are human. Some humans may have more access and some may not. Maybe more women have more access more often to their feelings for any number of reasons, including neurological reasons. But any man without feelings is a machine. Men have feelings that are men feelings. So as a good feminist, I really argued against that sexist, hidden sexism. Women felt praised by Jung. But if you do, as I did, I read the entire 26 volumes or so of the collected works. That may be the Oxford English Dictionary that has 26 volumes. But anyway, it's a whole lot of volumes of Jung. I read them a whole summer long, and I had to write a paper on them. And when you read into him, he's very sexist. And more damagingly sexist, in my opinion, because he wants to be praised, adored, admired for his specialized erudition. And Freud was really more modest. And once you get over penis envy, Freud's a little less sexist. So in any case, I don't buy that anybody at any one moment knows how your brain works or what your psyche is all about. So I went to Zurich. Okay, I'll go to Zurich where the real Jungians are, and I'll learn and I'll have two analysts at once. So I had one analyst who had been a physicist and one a musician. Arnie Mindell was the one who had been a physicist, by the way. You may read about him. He did a lot of body-focusing dream interpretation. And he was a very liberal, open guy. What liberal means is not, you know, bowing and bowing to everything Jung ever said. The last, Jung died in 1961, 30 years before the last woman got to vote in his country. 30 years. So his attitude toward women was pretty bizarre. His attitude toward having sex with patients was entirely unscrupulous and showed that he didn't understand the basic function of therapy. Do I feel strongly about this? Mm. Can you tell? Yeah. Uh, he, He abused the vulnerable women and didn't understand what he was doing. That shows me he didn't understand psychotherapy and he really didn't understand women's brains. So, I just noticed the picture got foggy again. It doesn't matter. I can make you all out. But for a you few, look fine. Okay, for a few seconds, it was very clear. I could see every student right there, the lady in the red designs and the red skirt over there. Okay. That's Chetty. She's from St. Croix, but she's visiting us on St. Thomas this week. Okay, Say nice. hi, Chetty. Hello, Chetty. Okay, so. She brings a Caribbean perspective to every dream we analyze. She, she brings up... Uh, um, Right, that's your question, isn't it? Yeah, so mm-hmm. she brings a special perspective. Of, Continue, cult, of cultural interpretations? Interpretations right. meant through tradition? Okay, we'll talk about that, and if I don't, bring it up, okay? So, in Zurich, I really threw in the towel. My dreams were saying, it's not here, you're going to get the good stuff. Uh, because all the interpreters were so rigid, and they had these rigid, fixed ideas about men and women from the 19th century. And... That was the 20th century, right? Now we're in the 21st, but still that was pretty backwards. So I came home and said, why don't we look at dreams? You go to sleep without a magical priest at your right hand, Freud, Jung, Pearls, who tells you what your psyche is like. You go to sleep with what you know about the world, what you think about the world, what you've heard things mean. And when you wake up in the morning, you should be able to understand your own dreams without somebody bringing to you all these interpretations that have made before they even knew you. So I started what I call the dream interview process. You can do this by yourself, and most times you will do it by yourself. I'm going to talk about it as if they're two people, because it's the easiest way to learn, and it's the easiest way to describe the technique. I say to my dreamer, pretend I come from another planet. Both of us are going to pretend that. So when you have a dream about Saint Croix, Saint Croix, Saint Croix, I'm going to say, pretend I've never been there before. What's it like? But if you had been born there, you'd say the same thing to the dreamer. If you had a dream about, um, oh, let's say Barack Obama. Political figures are really good to demonstrate how different our internal worlds are. I would say to you, pretend I've never heard of him before. I'd say that if he were my brother. Say, tell me, what is he like? What's he do? What's he like? And I want to get adjectives from you, so you describe him to me. I want to get 
your, what you think of as a definition, but it's really a description. It's a little bit association, but it's also description. What is he like? What do you know about this guy? And the things that come to you in your mind, in your words, are what I'm going to feed back to you. Okay, you say that Obama is blank, blank, and blank. And you say, yeah, but he's a little bit more this. I give you a chance to fix it up. Maybe I, I misemphasize something. Maybe I forgot a word you use. Maybe you're hearing that. You think, well, I don't really mean that. I mean he's more like this, this, and this. Okay, my neck, that's a description, a recapitulation, and now I'm going to do a bridge question. I'm going to help the dreamer look for a metaphor. How does what you see as Obama bridge to something, someone, or some part of yourself in your life? Again, I leave the dreamer free to choose subjective or objective levels, which you've heard about with Jung, and whether it's a part of you or a situation in your life or whether it's somebody else in your life. So this guy whom you describe as adjective, 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 they're the most easiest to work with, does he remind you of anybody in your life or any part of yourself or anyone in your life who's like Obama, whom you describe as, and those will be the words, not my words, that the dreamer will usually recognize, oh my God, that really reminds me of blank, of a situation in my life, of my brother, of myself, of my father, of my sister, or of my professor, five, for all we know, okay? So that the basic technique, and those are the three short steps, get a good description of the image in the dream, recapitulate that description, and then try to bridge it. So it's, I want you all to chant this with me for a minute. I know it feels silly, but you'll find it useful. Description, recapitulation, bridge. Description, Description re recapitulation, bridge. And bridge. Try it again. Description, recapitulation, and bridge. When you on, we, ought to make a, we ought to make this into a haiku. All right, <laughs> hang on. I'm going to turn the microphone around. Can everybody chant that one? Make it like a song. Description, recapitulation, bridge. Description, recapitulation, bridge. Man, I'm going to turn it into something okay. you can sing to. It is so helpful <laughs> when I put people into their small groups to do it. They go, okay, I've done this image. Have I done description, recapitulation, bridge? And recapitulation so, is a big word. Restatement right. is easier, but recapitulation means to feed it back with slight editing. You want to All keep right. the so tone the, the same? Description, I'm asking the other person to describe the character or the situation or the item in the dream. Yep. And then recapitulate it where I give it back to them saying, you said this, you said this, you said this. And then how do we bridge it back to your life? What does that remind you of in your in the real world, in the in the waking world? The question That's I, the bridge. Right. Right. The All question right. I never ask is, what does this mean to you? Never. It's exactly what I want to know. But if I ask, what does a horse mean to you? I'm going to get all kinds of projections from what the dreamer thinks it should mean, what she's heard it's interpreted as. I'm not going to get her open-hearted description of what horses are like. It's very different. But you get to what the dreamer thinks it means to her when she knows enough about the image to hear the word she describes a horse with is exactly what she describes somebody else in her life as or some part of herself. So if I ask the question, what what uh, this this horse? Tell me about a horse like I've never seen one before. Tell me all the qualities that horses have that make them interesting to you. Uh, then I'm going to get your words to describe this component of the dream that's that's active. That's it's, the active part of the dream. This is true. And now we get to the phrasing of the questions. You see the, Go ahead. the steps of the dream: description, recapitulation, bridge. That's the steps of the interpretive method. There are two more key ones, but. Right now, we're going to just talk about these three. What you need to get a good description are good questions. If you say, now, would you be so good as to tell me what a horse means to you? When you've used a lot of extra words, you've lost the drama of the dream, and you're asking her to make an interpretation before she knows what she thinks about a horse. So if you say, what a horse is like, pretend I come from another planet. You have to remind people at first. And I use the word, what a horse is like, so I don't get a long description of their 2,000 pound animals or 1,000 pound and their quadrupeds and they about this, that's boring. If the dreamer gets bored, you're lost. But what are horses like? And a dreamer might say, let me, let me get a description of horse from someone in the group. A few adjectives. Okay, you in the pinky red dress. In the pinky red dress. 
just a few adjectives. What are horses like? Oh, that's nice. There we go. So this is going to be the hot seat, folks. And if you want to ask questions, you're going to come up to the camera and to the mic. Hello. 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 <laughs> okay, I was thinking free spirited. Free spirited. Horses are free spirited. And what else? They're free spirited. What else do they like? How are they different from dogs or elephants or zebras? <laughs> Somebody else said they were stupid. I think they were kind of um, uh, on right because basically I read some stuff about horses and if you cover them with a blanket, they would. She's on deck. She's talking to Mike. We'll get your chance. Okay. I want you to oh, yeah. What else do you. Like, okay, you give, me, give me three adjectives that describe a horse. Free spirited. Stupid? Is that what you said? It doesn't <laughs> matter. It doesn't matter. You can't be politically correct. You've got to say whatever comes to your mind. Okay, free spirited, fast, and I don't know. That's good. That's okay. Now, would somebody else quickly come up to the same chair and give me a different, things that came to you were different? Tell me what horses are like. I come from another planet. I'm only interested in your ideas. Give me a few adjectives. Okay, I think they're strong. Mm -hmm. They're also very, um, how do you say, obedient. Okay. And they, they are, even though they're obedient, they are um, strong-minded in their own way. Okay, good. Thank you very much. What's your uh, name? You want my name? Yeah. Ashlyn. Ashlyn. Ashley. A-S-H-L-Y-N. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay, so we could do this for everybody in the room. And, oh, we got somebody else. Hi there. What's your name? Um, Alicia Hazel. Okay, what, what would you tell me horses are like? Wild, a bit dumb, and fast. Okay, so yours is pretty similar to the first lady. And what's her name? Oh, Darian. Darian? Yeah. yeah, it was before. Okay, so, all right. Um, wild, oh, I can't read my writing. Alicia, what did you say? Wild blank. Wild, um, a uh, um, polite word for stupid, um, dull, a little bit dull, Are you and fast. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, now this brings up some really good issues. If you're going to get a good description from a dreamer, You've got to encourage the dreamer to say, don't be politically correct. It's what you really feel that you put up there in your dreams on racial issues, on sexual issues, on political issues. If you're always nice in your descriptions, you won't get to the juice. And if, if Alicia thinks horses are dumb, that's the words that's going to trigger her association. Okay, so now I want you just to notice something. If uh, Darianne, Alicia, and Alicia, oh, Ashlyn, Ashlyn, right? Okay. Um, all had horse dreams. Could you find one archetypal description of horse that's going to interpret the dream for them? Uh uh Nothing I've ever read in, in Jung, who has horse as big and strong, had to do with dumb. No, 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 no. But let's say that Alicia's dreaming of a guy. <laughs> now, let's just say she has this dream, and she tells me the horse is wild, it's sort of dumb, and she tries to be nice about it, but she really meant dumb and fast. Is there anything in your life that's like that? And it might be some guy who's coming after her. It might be her brother. It could be somebody who's making some really dumb comments lately. Dumb would be the key word. I never use anything but the dreamer's own words. And that's because they trigger what the dreamer thinks. Ashlyn, on the other hand, hers is a horse where strong is the big point. And they're, oh, my handwriting is so terrible. Strong and something dent. Independent? Um, I said, I said smart. Yeah? Oh, I said um, obedient. Obedient, right. And obedient. So what in your life, if you'd had this dream, is strong, obedient, but they're also strong in their own minds. You said something like, you know, a will of their own or something. And she would, if she had that dream, there would be something in her life or some part of herself that's like that. But if I take away her freedom to give me the words, 
that are the words she thinks in when she thinks of this bridged factor, we won't get there. So now I have a little um, example for you all. I had a client, no, it wasn't a client, it was someone in a dream lecture, big lecture, huge number of people. And someone in the way in the back said, oh, I have a dream, I have a dream. It's always women who are most courageous in telling their dreams. She said, it's a recurring dream even. So those are dreams that show that there's a recurring issue. And her dream was about a cat. So I'd like you all to write down on a piece of paper what you've heard cats mean in dreams. That's what you've heard. What, you know, psychotherapist, myths, what your grandmother told you. Write down, what does a cat in a dream mean? Now I'd like you to write down what you think a cat in a dream probably means. I know that you've read enough that you can't be definitive till you talk to the dreamer, right? Okay. So now I'm going to tell you the dream of this wonderful woman. She said, Gail, I have this recurring dream that there's a beautiful, black, sleek cat on my windowsill. It comes into my room, runs all around, it raises a ruckus, and it leaves. Okay, dreamers don't always tell you the whole story when it's oral. I ask people usually to write down their dreams when I see them or when they email me a dream. If I see it written out, there's much more detail. But here we are, you know, she only had a minute or two, she thought. So I said, okay, let me get to some more of the facts of the dream. That's something Monty Ullman does too. Um, I said, so it's a black cat on your windowsill. In what room does it come? Oh, it comes into my bedroom. Okay, and then it leaves. How do you feel at the last minute of the dream? This is a key question, everybody. Before you wake up at that last minute, how do you feel? It's a judgment on the dream. She said, I was in tears. I was so sad. I felt so bereft. Okay, so now, thinking about all the things that you've heard cats mean, think where we could go with this. And she would say, oh, really, doctor? Thank you so much. That's my mother. Or that's the female principal whatever that is. Okay, so I said to her, instead of being a good interviewer, pretend I come from another planet. I've never seen a cat before. What are cats like? I asked for a generic description first. Short. And she said, well, they are sleek and agile and beautiful things, beautiful creatures. And they are distant and aloof and they love you when they want to, leave you when they want to. Okay, so what was the one in your dream like? Because it might have been different from her generic description. She said, nope, just like that, except mine was a black cat, and it was gorgeous and sleek. Okay, so I feed back to her. I do a recapitulation and say, so, have I got this right? That cats are sleek, agile, this one's gorgeous, this one's black, and they love you when they want to, leave you when they want to, they're distant and aloof. She, yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so she was happy with that description. I like to check because the dreamer sometimes wants to modify it. Or I screw up and come up with a different word. I said, so, is, th now I don't say, would you mind tell me, would we think about, could it possibly mean, I don't say any of those introductory lines. I'm like in an action movie with it. I said, so, is there anything in your life, anyone in your life, or any part of yourself, that's like a black, a black, a black sleek, sleek, gorgeous cat that come, that's distant and aloof, loves you when it wants to, leaves you when it wants to, comes into your bedroom, raises a ruckus, and leaves, and you're in tears because you feel so bereft. Well, she said, well, of course, that's my boyfriend. And he's gorgeous, and he's black, and he's sleek, and he's agile, and he's distant, and he loves me when he wants to, and he leaves me when he wants to. Okay. So, have a seat, relax, raise your hand if any other thoughts come to you, because I had to get on with the lecture we're doing, right? About five minutes later, she raises her hand. She says, Gail, all my life I can see I've chosen cats. What I need in my life is a dog. Somebody who's faithful, loves me. A one-man dog who wants to be there, wiggles his tail when I come home. That's what I need. I need to pick a different kind of man. 
Okay, she did this in one dream. How many years of therapy would that take most women? She was attracted to the sleek and agile guys who are distant and aloof. We can find out why later. Maybe she had a model father, older brother like that, and that's the kind of love she wanted to get. Maybe. But the point is, right in the here and now, she figured out a whole pattern of choosing men that has led her to nothing but sadness. She picked the aloof, distant guys who love you when they want to. And she needed a dog. She needed a dog feeling. Very useful. What if I had said to her, now, oh, uninstructed one, let me tell you from my years of reading myths and of reading Jung and Freud that this cat has something to do with your femininity. Well, is she going to say no? She'll go down that trail. But much better, I think, not to put in any ideas, any suggestions, but instead to say, what are cats like? And I just follow that description. And that'll lead us to, I think, the really accurate thing she meant her dream to be about. So do you have any questions about what we did? We did the description, the recapitulation, and the bridge. And I didn't do a whole lot of other things. He's got a question for Dr. Jeff. And look, what's the matter? The chair is open. Uh, well, I have no Come up and sit Come on up, because then we can hear you. Look at the camera and talk on the mic. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Si. 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 My question is in reference to myth and culture methods. Okay. Okay. ¿Cuál es? What is it? I, um, ¿Cuál es? ¿Cuál es? Si. Sí. Sí. <laughs> Hablo italiano, pero puedo a, vo oh, a veces italiano. hablar no, en español. No, no italiano, español. But, um, well, I'm studying uh, psychology, and I got into this dream class mm -hmm. because of the professor and what the class was all about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's actually driving me kind of crazy, but since I'm studying psychology, <laughs> I'm holding it together. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I'm quite, you know, I wanted to know more about myths of culture. Like here in the Caribbean culture, I mean, you know, we have different myths when it comes down to dreaming and interpretation of them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just need you, like, I, I've been reading about Jung, and he has that part about the spiritual and thing. So I wanted it a little bit more clear, because, like, mm -hmm. when, uh, as a Caribbean person, African descendant, we have, especially the Spanish part, we have the Santos, like, sí. eh, which is the, the seven, La Siete Potencia, I don't know if you're familiar with the mm -hmm. Cuban Afro... Uh, Myth, uh, I've, heard traditions of, of I've heard of it. Spirituality, you heard mm -hmm, of it? Mm -hmm. And they, depending on what you dream, and you have these saints that you are born like with a spirit design, mm -hmm. which is one of the Catholic saints. Yes. And, and then they come to you in dreams to warn you about certain different things. Uh, it all depends on whether you're doing the right thing in life or you're going to get in trouble or, mm -hmm. you know. So I just wanted you to like to kind of clear that part from your perspective and cultural mix and methods. Okay. You know, my cultural mix includes a little bit of Cuba because my parents lived there a little bit during the war and two Cuban ladies brought me up and that's why I spoke Spanish until I was five. And uh, then they went back unfortunately and got imprisoned until some number of years later. But I have wonderful feelings for Cuban life and they, I did hear a little bit about this but it was a long time ago. And when they came back to visit when I was growing up. But if what did you write down for the meaning of a cat? What did you write down from what you've heard? Well, the, uh, I usually like do the opposite. For the meaning of cat, they usually say it's bad luck. But to me, I usually look at it as good luck. Okay. And the part about devil, I usually look at the opposite of the word devil and mm -hmm. it's live. Okay. And there are whole and traditions that focus on the opposite of everything. But right. in each so case, I, you... I usually uh, uh, focus on the opposite when it comes down to stuff that I like. This n okay. seven, number seven, some people say it's like bad luck. To me, it's like sa eh, la siete potencia, mm -hmm. which is, uh, it goes back to the Yoruba religion coming from Africa and through Cuba. Okay, so okay. now yeah. that's you, and, and that may and be that relevant to your dreams, me. because that's because what you that's believe me. already. Okay. It may not be relevant to someone who's never heard of it. Now, now, this dream the dream. cat, you think it would be good news? 
to me. Okay. okay. So what so, do you think in the <laughs> overall? Was this good or bad news to this dreamer? To me, it's, it's good good news to the dreamer. Okay. Now, I would say it was bad news boyfriend for her because of what she believes about cats. That caused her pain. But it was good news that she figured it out. So you can see the good, bad news stuff is quite something we can move around. And I think it's important not to impose your belief system on some other dream. Else. And who knows, you may have a dream about seven or a cat that follows a particular tradition, but then if you had a close cat that you loved who just died or died years ago, if you dream about that particular cat being starved, could be about you're not paying attention to that part of yourself that you loved that was like the cat. I don't know. We'd have to find out for a particular dream at a time in your life. So I think you use different meanings at different times. But I want to find out each time what your dream image means in your life right now. Does that answer it? And I can't give it shorter than a three-hour answer. But in, oh, no. in, myth, in myth, I want I don't want myth to intrude because it's an external symbol system. If it comes out of the dreamer, fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Can I interject a, a thought on and again? No, I just want to talk for a second about culture myth. Gail and I haven't talked for since 1972, and and she probably doesn't know that I spent time with Margaret Mead. And I just I want to interject the thought that that your culture provides you with a vocabulary, and that the symbols and images that you acquired as a child in your culture are in you. In the same way that there, there may be universal myths, and this is where I, I break but, with you. But no, wait, I don't know. But that's where exactly the question is: What are cats, horses, number seven like? It's, you it's ask your the number seven. It's your cat, and some of that's got to be coming from your culture. That that's what got imparted to you as a child. Uh, uh, Chetty's got stories about cats meaning whatever her Cuban Afro Caribbean story is. That that's in her. Yes, and, and, and it would I need come out of her. To her culture in order to be able to to right. help her with it. No. Your method is going to extract all that. You're going to right. bring that out of everybody. I don't whatever need Whatever your system, whatever the person's right. culture is, your method is asking them to tell you exactly. what their culture is rather and than you telling them what your culture is. Right. And furthermore, right. I get to find out what that dreamer's use in this particular dream is because Chetty could have a dream about a cat that is good news. But what if the cat in the dream is starving and she hasn't been, she realizes she was supposed to be feeding her or this cat and she's forgotten to for three weeks and the poor cat is starving for three days and she needs to give it food and sustenance and attention. So that cat is modified that she needs to take care of this good news piece but she's been ignoring that part of herself. You see what I mean? So the dream makes it very specific. Your general yeah. meaning and your specific yeah. meaning at this time in your life. Okay, so who else has a question? Come to the seat. Come to the seat. Come to the seat. Come to the hot seat. Fritz Pearls would sit in the seat, make you talk to your other dream part. Yeah, he yeah. would. Here comes Josie. But, but talk to the captain. Hi, what's hi, your hi. name? I'm Josie. Hi, Josie. Hi, Josie. Um, I just have a question on kind of what you think or like what you've read and come to think about cultural dream building versus like the um, collective unconscious. Do you think like since culture is based on your interactions with people and you're alone, I, I mean, I guess you yourself are alone even if somebody's in your bed at night, um, you're creating the dream. Do you think the collective unconscious like the things that we're born instilled with in our minds is creating the dream more, or do you think the culture is creating the dream more? Neither. Not, Neither. Not, I, I have I, very little very appreciation, appreciation for the collective, for the collective unconscious. unconscious. Jung made out of a little thing this big a whole world. I don't like it. Don't you can read my books and my find out why. Down. You're dreaming yeah. about your yeah. life, yeah. your issues yeah. and your yeah. concerns, yeah. everyday yeah. concerns. And you use imagery that you've heard about, that you've heard traditions about, or just life. Yeah, yeah I'm going to interrupt to tell you that you're breaking up. Take okay. a break for a second, let the phone catch up, and okay. take that speech from the top again, please. Okay. I'm not so crazy about 
All right. I'm not crazy about the collective unconscious. I think Jung made a big deal out of a very little piece. People who are looking for spiritual meaning say, oh, but I'm more important if I'm collected and part of the collective unconscious. If you use, see the examples he uses from dreams in his collected work, he uses the same ones over and over and over again. We do have common dreams. We have common dream themes. I wrote a whole book on 50, 60 common themes that we have. But that doesn't mean ever that they mean the same thing, except in so much as we're human, and we know that when we fall, we usually are anxious. Not always. Uh, the archetypes that Jung saw as part of how the human psyche is arranged, well, that's his picture. It's not my picture. I like the idea that we individuate, that we become more ourselves, and we have these various parts of ourselves that we integrate, and that I'm very fundamentally Jungian. Dreams are helping you grow. Uh, Freud didn't see that, and, that, and that's huge. But uh, this need to be spiritually connected to the whole universe, I want to be someone who has golden orbs in my dreams, I want to have spiritual dreams. I ask you, what in life is not spiritual? I had a, a therapist who was Jungian. She said, Gail, I'm so embarrassed. The dreams I brought in for the last five times to the dream group are just so mundane. They're about my relationship with my boyfriend and with my son. And I wanted to have spiritual dreams to bring in because she wanted to look sparkling, right? And I said, so what's not spiritual about dealing with your real issues with love and your boyfriend? What's not spiritual about treating well and understanding well, you know, the most important person in your life, your son? What's not spiritual about anything in life? So I I am very suspicious of the, the spiritual climbing that goes on in a lot of spiritual disciplines, and we follow whatever the local priest tells us, rather than becoming yourself more fully, honestly, and getting along with everybody in our life, honestly and with love, and helping everybody else around us grow. That's what I think is spiritual. So I just leave that one out. And to the degree that we have common connections to archetypal worlds, that's fine, that's interesting, but it's not for me to tell the dreamer, this is your animus, this is your old wise woman. No, this is a part of you. Why insert the middleman, the archetypal imagery story? So I'm very direct, I'm very right in here and now, and I think that over time will show you your own path to development and growth. And you'll be dealing with the real world, which I think is terribly important, your relationships. Any other comment? Okay. Thank you, Freud. Thank you, Anybody want to raise a question? I'll translate for doing Question, St. Freud. No questions. No questions, St. Freud. Thomas, anybody else? Okay, I've got... Here comes the color. Here comes Marisha. Hello, Marisha. Hi. 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 My name is Marisha. I just wanted to tell you you're so pretty. Oh, and she's sweet. Thank you. You know when you, when you're about to turn when you're about to turn 65, that's very nice to hear. Thank you. Yeah, well, you can't see. You know. Let's. She's the dream wizard. Who's got a question? Alicia Hayes. I went to. I went to. Someone else. Come on. Alex. Alex, before the next question. This is this is Bolashana I am Koya. Hi. Say Tell that again. She can try and figure that one out. I'm Bolashade I am Koya. Bolashade I am Koya. Oh wow, that's yeah. pretty. From Oakland, California, so we're kind of from the same we're kind of from the same area. We're uh -huh. with Mill Valley. Well, great. Okay, what's your okay. question? Um, I want to know. I'm reading your um. You're a book called The Dream Kit right now. The yes. uh, dream kit book that you wrote um, with the with the, a workbook in the back. Yes. And, and I was wondering, like, what inspires you to write a dream kit book? Ah, uh, okay. I keep trying to make it not look so hard. People love dream dictionaries. If I look up frog, this is what it means. But then they know that's nonsense because it depends on your frog, what you think about frogs what your frog what is doing in the dream, in the dream. right? Right. So yeah. I want to make it look 
simple and fun right away. And so the dream kit had the cue cards. These are the questions you ask yourself or the other dreamer. And I wanted it to be easier for people to listen more auditorily than like to read. And I encourage you to do it. I thought it'd be fun to make a game of it. Just various ways, because people think it's hard. And indeed, the dreams make you look at yourself. So that's a little, you know. But once you get the hang of it, your dreams help you solve problems. You incubate your dreams. I want to talk about dream incubation, by the way. Um, how did you like it? What, what did you think of the dream kit? It, the original dream kit had eight uh, audio cassettes, by the way. It was much more complete. But you know what happens when you go to big publishers? Right. Unfortunately, I don't have the cassettes, and I just started reading it, so I'm, I'm like halfway through, and I haven't completed it. But I did want to know, like, how did the dream kit or enhance the dreams that you had? How or, did writing so, it? How did writing it enhance my own dreams? No, like, how did the techniques and the dream incubation affects or enhance your dreams, and like how you dreamt or how you interpreted them? Okay. Okay. So dream so, incubation. incubation. Let me get to that second. Let me pick up an issue that's very important, asking for good descriptions. It's political correctness. If you answer only what seems polite, politically correct, you're not going to get to the point. Uh, you've got to say what you really think of the image. So let's say you have a dream of a co-worker, and her name is Sue. And I'd say, so who's Sue, and what is she like? And you say, well, she's very nice. And whenever people start with very nice, I know there's a big but, but am I going to hear it? Uh, yeah, well, what's he, she really like? Well, she can be a little bit stubborn at times. And, uh, well, let's say she's your boss. No, let's keep her as a, a co-worker. Okay, well, you don't want anyone knowing what you really think about Sue because you all have to work together. So being confidential is really important here throughout what if she really thinks, well, Sue is just such a bitch. She's selfish, she stabs people in the back, and she's really, um, well, probably the most selfish person I've ever met. And she's yeah. ignorant to boot, doesn't know what she's talking about. And all I heard was she's nice, but she can be a little stubborn. That dream will never get anywhere. You've got to be sure that you yourself or your dreamer is giving you an honest answer, and you promise never ever to tell what she really thinks about that person. Now, what we don't know is what is that going to bridge to? Does it bridge to Sue? Yeah, that's really what I'm dealing with in Sue. Or, you know, my mom was like that. Or, I was like that with my best friend yesterday. Sometimes it comes right back to you, and you won't be able to use the imagery of Sue until you really give us a good description. That goes across race issues when, let's say you have a dream about uh, a Burmese woman. Well, pretend I cover not on their planet. What are Burmese women like? Well, I don't really know any. Okay, what's your imagination of them? Well, I think Burmese women are this, this, and this. That's what's going to be carried in the dream imagery. All right? And in California, San Francisco, where we have gays and straights, got to get them all being talking about each other the way they really think at the time. And the scariest dream a gay man can have is of having a heterosexual dream. Oh, my gosh, I thought I had that all settled. Does that mean? No, I don't know, but what are heterosexuals like who look like this? And then they give you their descriptions. There's no image you can't unpack. If you tell the dreamer, pretend I come from another planet, I will never tell anybody what you say, but I need your honest description. Okay, that's so important. Okay, now get back to dream incubation. Okay. Tonight. So you have to make up yes? word unpack. That's your best word of the whole thing so far, unpacking the dream. You know, people. People have fought me on that word, and I now call it testing the bridge, but it, to me it is unpacking what you're thinking, unpacking the image. And when you have a bridge, yes, that reminds me of my brother. How so is the next question. How do you test how strong that bridge is? You unpack it. Well, he's like my brother this way. And I knew we were on the money when the dreamer with the cat, the minute she said, oh, that reminds me of boyfriend. And then she laid me laid out all those ways he's exactly like the things she just described rather than you know well he's agile but he's you know he's really very nice well that wasn't a good bridge that probably wasn't where it's going to go it should be a very good perfect match well, and on top of that when you unpack eventually you get to the underwear right <laughs> <laughs> you always have those socks when you pack and unpack it, you're going to find them or you get to the chocolate that you're carrying with you it's a wonderful 
Okay, good. Talk to us about incubation. That's a great thing. Okay, well, and, and Alex, my picture was that when you're making a bridge, you carry your baggage across the bridge with you and see where it fits. So as I was unpacking a suitcase, I had the same imagery. Maybe it's our vintage. Okay, so dream incubation. Asking your dreams to help you out with an issue you're concerned about. Tonight, it would be very nice to wake up tomorrow morning and have a dream that's going to help me organize my talk, organize my paper, tell me where I'm, why do I have trouble finding a good partner? Why do I keep having these repetitive fights with my mom or my sister? Or what's holding me back at school? Why can't I get more excited about it? You can ask a question about anything in your life, and there are ways to phrase it that get better responses from your dreams. Unfortunately, Dreams don't do well with the question, what shall I do with the rest of my life? That's a very good question. But I've never seen a dreamer get a good response. If she asks it this way, what keeps me from finding a career I like? What keeps me from finding a good mate? You get dreams about the issues that are you're stumbling on. And that's very handy. Let me tell you, it can change your life, can keep you from making a wrong marriage, having children, having a broken marriage, and having to start all over again. It can. Your dreams know from the first few times you date a guy or a woman, they know what the red flags are, and you ought to look at them. Maybe there'll always be some red flags, but there's some that are really more like skull and crossbones. Don't do this. Your dreams know early on. Why wait 20 or 30 years for your dreams to... There's something for you to listen to your dreams, okay? So you can ask for questions in math problems, science problems, something that you're involved with, that you've already worked with. I need help. And in uh, All About Dreams, I list a whole lot of creative science and arts and technology breakthroughs that have been made through people using their dreams to help them in a field they're already involved in. And all I can say is we know more while we're asleep, very often, than while we're awake. We're more synthetic in our thinking, less defensive. We see things, I think, a little more clearly. But when we wake up, if we're not lucky enough to get a really concrete dream, and some people are, then you have to interpret the metaphors. And that's when I pull in the dream interview method because I think it's so quick and to the point. So here's what you do to incubate a dream if you want to practice it tonight. You take your handy dream journal. You write down the date. You write down three or four lines about what you did and felt today. The highlights of your highs and lows. What'd you do? What'd you feel? And if you had a fight with a girlfriend, what was it about? Very short, four lines. Then you write down, if you're not sure what you want to ask, write down a few lines about what you want to dream about tonight. What do you want help with from your dreaming brain? And if you want to think that that's God, fine. I don't know where it comes from, but it's hot stuff. So, you write down your question. You, you're coming, oh, now you formulate the question. It's better than the first one you had. Okay, what keeps me from blank? Write it down, whatever phrasing you like best. Those are the ones I'm suggesting. There are many ways to do it. Turn out the light and immediately repeat that question or the phrase, I need help with blank. What keeps me from blank? How can I do better to, why do I keep having repetitive arguments with my boyfriend? Write down one question, only one per night. You'll want to do ten the first time you do this. One. Repeat the question over and over as you fall asleep, knowing that if you already had the answer, you'd have solved the problem. So be ready for new information or a new point of view. Go to sleep. When you wake up in the middle of the night or in the morning, write down whatever dream you had or whatever's on your mind. Don't make any judgment about whether or not you were successful. Most of the time this works. In one short master's degree study, it was like 80% of the time. You've got to go to sleep when you're not dead tired, no alcohol or, boot or drugs, and you focus really well on that question. Wake up, write down whatever's there, then do your morning toilette. Come back to your dream and interview yourself. See what your dream is about. Don't assume it's an answer to your question. And if it doesn't seem to be an answer to your question, look at your day notes, those four lines you wrote about what you did and felt, and it's about that stuff that superseded what you need, what you were asking about. And you can do this with a friend. I'd say, here, friend, interview me about my dream. And you can go on my site, 
uh, YourSleepingGenius.com and download the questions, the questions for people, settings, objects, feelings, actions. And you just show someone how to ask you these questions. And then you've got an interview going, find out what your dream is about before you decide whether or not it's an answer to your question. Again, being more open is good. You don't want to miss a perfectly good dream about your relationship with your father, which may be screwing you up and your self-esteem issues, when you're busy really wanting to dream on your math problem. Well, maybe that didn't make it up to the top rank that particular night. Then incubate the next time and the next time until you get an answer. Okay, that's what you do. It's really fun because it convinces you immediately that your dreams are on your side. They're here to help you. They're not here to torment you. And let me just say one more thing about nightmares in general. They are your best friends. They're about something going wrong in your life, something you're doing that's stupid. If you're a horse, dumb. And know it now rather than 20 years later. Okay? And figure out what you're doing that causes you a nightmare. I had a client who was a photographer, and he said he was photographing Loma and me, actually, for a whole day, my partner, Loma Flowers. And he said, I had this dream just last night because I knew I was coming in. That's probably why I remembered dreams because I knew I was going to be photographing you all day long. In the dream, I have a gun and I shoot myself in the head and I feel no pain. And so we said, so is it a good thing for humans to shoot themselves in the head? So no, it's stupid. It's a terrible thing to do and it kills you. It takes you out of the game of life. And what was it like to feel no pain? Did you expect to feel pain? Yeah. Okay. So Loma and I together in perfect unison said, so is there any way in your life you're shooting yourself in the head to feel no pain? And he said, yes. I've just started back on my heroin habit. Mmm, big deal. To get it, and, it's, and he said, you know, that's like shooting myself in the head. It really is, and I have to deal with that. So if you work with people, yourself, in people in recovery, they will have dreams that show they're getting back into the circles of friends, into the activities that led them to their addiction. And they'll dream about their addiction as something terribly life-threatening to them. And it's very helpful to get the advance warning. Just like advance warning on this guy's not right for you. Look at him, okay? So use your nightmares. Don't be afraid of them. They're great things to have. They can save a life. Okay. Okay. We're, we're just Thank about you. out of time. I think we have room for one more question. Who's hot? I have a question. Okay. Come on, come on over. Do the chair. The reason they're not looking at you is looking at the television screen. I know, right. but I still see you. You still see us. Hi, hi, Dale. Hi there. Two quick questions. One, how much of your life have you actually focused and used your dreams to determine making major decisions? Huge portion. I would say of my important decisions in my life, probably 80%, you know, and I'm post figuring out how to do dreams this way, post the age of about 21, 22. My dreams have helped me choose a husband, work through a divorce 20 years later with that very good husband. It was a very friendly divorce. Choose my career. I was going to be in Russian economics and politics. And I switched over because dreams said you could switch at the last minute, you know. Um, dreams in the Association for the Study of Dream, where I was having to deal with a whole lot of negative, backbiting, nastiness, and the dream showed me this is how you deal with it. This is going to be. This is how it is in groups. This is how you deal. And it kept me working in dreams when I was emotionally very hurt and painful. Um, helped me in being my in my single life, choosing guys and not guys, and said, Oh no, 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 not that one. And for the last four years, I have been with the most marvelous, loving man. And my dreams helped me recognize a good thing when I saw it, both my experience and my dreams. Um, they helped me write my books, organize my talks, because my brain is working just like yours all night long. And when I was 21, I got turned on to that fact. So why wouldn't I use it? And they have never gotten a bum steer from my dreams. But I've never given foolish interpretations. This is what Freud would say. This is what Jung would say. Because if so, I would probably be a sheepish, shy little woman at this point, you know. And my dreams kept saying, live big, live loud. Don't be intimidated. Don't try to look like the normal psychologist in the brown suit with um, a big man's watch on. You'll read that dream in my, in my book. 
how it said, live your life, you know, be an ice skater, be outrageous, be different, be full of life. And that probably the biggest thing dreams have given me. They've said, don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated by people, by psychological systems, but don't be intimidated by society that says you should be this way. I mean, we all are to some degree and that keeps us in society, but in general, dreams have said, go ahead, do it your way, have fun, show people you're alive. Awesome. The other one is a lot of dreams for me lately have been about residue, nothing but residue, day residue. Okay. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, I already know what happened during the day. So is it that I'm so consumed with it that I can't get rid of it? I would bet. I'm just going to make a bet that if you could get someone to interview you about your day residue, which is a big put down that Freud gave us. Oh, it's just day residue. Well, you go to sleep tonight. You're going to have had all what experiences you had today, all of those. And they're fresh in your mind. They're crisp. And even if it was just going to the grocery store and buying a pineapple and a few coconuts, because I love coconuts and I love this coconut image you have. And you get home and you realize you'd forgotten to pick up the spinach. Okay, so as in that, just day residue for you. Really boring, but there was something different. There was a spinach you forgotten. In waking life, you didn't forget the spinach. In waking life, you didn't even go to the grocery store, but you did have to do with pineapples and with coconuts during the day. So I'd ask you, what are of all the things you could have dreamt out, all the day residue images you could have had, why did my dreamer pick this and this? So I'd say, what are coconuts like? Pretend I've never heard of one before. What are pineapples like? And what is spinach like? And so is there some way you're forgetting the spinach in your bundle of groceries that you've already told me you use to feed yourself and your family? So I would just bet it's a rare dream that's just day residue unless, and this won't happen on an island, you've been driving for eight hours and All you see at night are these bright lights coming at you from the cars and no action in the dream. That's different. But a dream that tells a story uses your day residue. Teach yourself. Day residue is the fresh, fresh, hot off the presses stuff. These are good images because I remember what I thought about it yesterday. You don't have to go back. A dream that's, say, 10 years old. You have to remember what you were like and what you thought of pineapples when you were 10 years old. Well, you know, maybe you'll get there. Maybe you won't. What you thought of your brother when you were 10 as opposed to your brother when you're 20, okay? So look at day residue as fresh, hot off the press as imagery that's crisp and you can use it. Treat it with honor and see if it gives you good information. It usually does. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Well, goodbye, class. It's been a pleasure and I wish I could be there in person in so many ways. (laughs) <laughs> oh, well, Gail, don't assume that won't happen, because I think we have, we've created here the um, a longer-term plan. This class is a, a first time here at UVI, and we may be able to get this to happen again. If it does, if we do this class again here, then I'm going to fly you out, and we're going to do this face-to-face, and we're going to do this with, with, I'm just amazed, having not worked with you personally for so many years that we're on exactly the same page I we are talking so about isn't it amazing i mean it's just funny they've all been listening to me the whole semester they're hearing you and it's like con- <laughs> uh, just just remarkably here's here's I, chenny again here chenny I, talk to the mic i wanted to ask you another question in reference to you know when you talk about like dreaming about uh, about obama yeah like I, well right are those like archetypes but I, I've been dreaming, like, the dreams that I've been having is about, like, my car and also those uh, people like Josephine Baker, uh, Obama, uh, Harriet Tubman, and and I see myself in the dream with them. Good. Well, good. I was going to say good for you, but that's my projection, right? Do you like Obama? Do you like Harriet Tubman? Yes. Okay, Josephine Baker? Yes. Okay. And I'd ask you who, I, if we had time, I'd say, who is each one and what is she like? And you would take the parts of them that you most think of, maybe that you most admire if you like them. And then I'd say, so there you are in the dream. What's going on between you and them? Are they welcoming you into their circle? Are they excluding you? Are you feeling good about them? What's going on? No, I'm feeling good. Like with the one with Obama, I had issues with the, my health. And, you know, the, he was talking about, like, the Obamacare, and I was, like, he was kind of disappointed, and I was, like, rubbing his back. Michelle was there. It was nothing, like, sexual or anything like that. Uh, with Harriet Tubman, you know, she did that uh, cross of 
taking people from one area to the other one. And I live here in the Caribbean, and I always feel, uh, think about connecting the dots where you have islands that we all mix. Yes. Like from, from the Virgin Islands, they went to the Dominican Republic, and there was an Antiguan petition, everybody in, in the 1900s going to that island to work. When it comes down to Josephine Baker, you know, she was that singer, which is something that I'm going to, I'm getting into, like Spanish blues. And then I don't have any children, but Josephine Baker didn't have any, and she had this big adoption, and, and she bought this big house. Huge house you know, outside of Paris. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't know, but in, in all of the dreams, I was welcome, and I was part of them. Okay, so... For each one, I take one dream at a time, and I'd say, so, how, if that, is that a part of you? And I would bet you're going to say, yes, that's a part of you. You you associate with those feelings, those attitudes, those goals, those values. Right. And how can you use, I, there's more action in the dream. Is there a conflict in the dream? Is there, are they helping you? Do they have something to teach you? Um, right. And so... What I want to get to, and it's hard to do without asking you all the way through in the dream because it sounds like I'm projecting, but I think what you would do is say, these are the heroes in my head. These are the people I want to emulate in this way, that way, and that way. And the dream gives you a presence. You are with them. Doesn't it give you a stronger sense of yourself as Harriet Tubman? Does it motivate you to be more like her? Well, yeah, to not, not, yeah. Not in the details in your time and place, right. but... But, that, uh, yeah, with, when it comes down to that purpose and that goal of exactly. making it better... Exactly. ...or of, of, of accomplishing something with substance. Yes. So, yeah. what I tell people to do with these kinds of dreams, oh, I love them, I love them. Most people think, well, it's just wish fulfillment. No, it's not. Put that woman in your head and say, she's a hero of my head, heroine, hero, and say, today I'm going to walk around and say to myself... What would Harriet Tubman do? How would Harriet Tubman think about this thing? Or when you're thinking something negative about yourself, if I were Obama, if I were Harriet Tubman, if I were um, Josephine, Baker. Josephine, what would she do? And it doesn't matter if what you say is accurate. It's your image of these people, and you're focusing on the certain aspects. And you will walk differently. You will feel of yourself enhanced, empowered, and each one of those people carry something for you that's very meaningful, and you can grow with them as an inner model. It doesn't have to be the whole person, the part that got into trouble, the part that had... No, what you're focusing on in the dream is the positive part. Right, the difference that they made. Exactly. So grow okay. that way, and keep that in your mind for at least three days, and reread the dream every once every three days. No, once for three days at a time. And you... Oh. It will just become part of you, a much stronger part of yourself. Okay. Well, I want to do the dream of saying why I'm not financially independent. That's what <laughs> okay. <laughs> what keeps me from making a good living? Financially independent may be asking for a lot, but start. Okay. So okay. Uh, cut it. Well, yeah, be more specific. It's yeah. too broad if I say financial independence. Yeah. So just do it like change my bank account. <laughs> What's so, keeping me from changing my bank account? Well... I'd say, what's keeping me from uh, being financially comfortable or making enough, making a good living? What's keeping me from? What's keeping me yeah. from? Yeah, and, and then you ask for one piece at a time because it may be that you have to learn about finances. It may be that you need to do something else or, or get a specialist with finances. I don't know what your situation is, but you know. And your dreams don't do magic, but they do take you the next step. Okay. Right. Gracias. Gracias a usted. Good. One more, one more. And when I grow up, I want to look just like you. I'm like 52 and you're 65. All right. <laughs> Gracias a un cora. <laughs> All right. Here comes Alicia. Sorry, sorry. We're out of here, guys. Hello. Um, hey, so... um. I was reading your sensual dreaming book. Um, I was told, <laughs> I was told that um, I should step out of my comfort zone. So Dr. Randall said, "Yeah, read that, read that." And the thing is, I can't really link to it as much because, you know. Um, we have to add here that Alicia is the daughter of ministers. <laughs> so, anyways, so but I found it intriguing. So when you said incubation, I'm like one less question I have to ask because I was think I tried it. Didn't really work for me, but I that's my fault because I was doing the stuff you said not to do. Uh -huh. um, 
And another thing is that I was looking at is also the interview that you do as well as, wait, pass my book? No, I have my book. Okay. okay. Oh, let, let me say something about the sexual dreams and uh, yeah. conservative parents. Uh, <laughs> What, you know what the Bible Belt is in America? Very literalist people who are very strict about the Bible and the world's only 5,000 years old and, I mean, really, really rigid. So I was giving a talk in that environment and sexual dreams came up and some woman raised her hand and said, how do you know those dreams are from the devil? And I said, well, let me tell you, when I've worked with every dream over 30 years, now it's 40 years, every dream I've ever worked with and I know we do naughty things in our dreams that we're told we're not supposed to do. But when you interpret even those naughty dreams where you're having sex with someone you shouldn't have sex with or whatever, if you work through the dream, the dream's trying to help you understand yourself better, understand the people you love better, and sex is usually a metaphor for relationship. Sometimes it's about your own inhibitions, which, if you have too many of them, ruins your marriage which leads to a divorce, which leads to kids with a divorced and unhappy mother. So what you want is for people not to have unnecessary inhibitions about sexuality, so they're honest and good and true about it, and that they understand the metaphor in the dream if somebody's being pushy or somebody's doing the wrong thing, or if you're making love to a movie star, sometimes that movie star is a part of your boyfriend or husband whom you haven't been appreciating. You know, the... Brad Pitt of your husband. It's not that you're really going to go off with Brad Pitt, but you've been not appreciating that part of him. So what these dreams do is they give you the fruits of the spirit. Use that with your parents. They make, <laughs> they make you more humble because you understand yourself better. They make you kinder, more generous, more loving, and less tied up in your own neurotic inhibitions and fearfulness. God doesn't want you to be afraid. He wants you to be loving. That's what I have seen every single dream I have ever worked with lead somebody to. I have not worked with schizophrenic dreams. People who come into my ex-husband, a psychiatrist, and say, I have a hit list. I don't know what's going on there. I don't know. That's not my population. But in people whose brains are working logically, they're trying to become better people when they dream, even in their, their raunchy sexual dreams. Yeah, and I, I, I like the fact that your book, your book really opened this for me because it was vaguely mentioned, like mentioned already in dream class, but when you say um your dreams express who you are or who you want to be it's kind of like your character who you are when no one is looking yes and so it was just like that's my <laughs> mind blown so i was like is you're right because life's decision won't be as hard because secretly you already know the answer to all your issues it's just that society and the culture of which you're raised makes some kind of contradiction against your initial decision so well, and then another and, thing i was and, thinking and leave room for maturing. As you get older, you make wiser choices. You learn more. Mm -hmm. So the teenager might have some really bad ideas about how good it is to drink booze and speed in a car. right? Mm -hmm. But inside, he knows that's life-threatening, and so he's having nightmares about it, something that's threatening his life. So yeah, inside you do know. Yeah, and one last thing, because I know you guys go So the coconuts thing, right? The, um, basically picking it up. I Honestly, I didn't know it was a coconut till today. I thought it was a globe, like the people psychics use. Like, ooh, and that. It was a globe. It was a globe. It was a coconut. Okay, okay. I'm in the Caribbean. I can't use a globe. I got to use coconuts. I, I thought it was a globe. I guess I was right. So basically, I was saying, I noticed that you were saying about the dreams, about how you try not to interpret it. But then I took it a little step further while reading your book, and I was saying, in a way, we are kind of interpreting our dreams. But since it's our dreams, we have that right to interpret it to the way that we want to. And the thing is, as well, is that we're not interpreting it as a whole, but we're interpreting segments of it. Like in your book, With Sensual Dreaming, you're saying that the dreams you have about sex can help you with different areas of your life, not all sexual, mm -hmm. but some can help you overcome shyness, overcome different things in your book. So I was like, this actually makes a lot of sense. Even though I myself don't have sexual dreams, I guess, yet, um, <laughs> um, I actually found myself intrigued because these things make a lot of sense. And I'm just, just between me and you, nobody else, right? I'm making a, I'm making a um, presentation about it, actually, for class. And I was like, what hints do you think I should touch? Because the book is so vast. What especially would you want 
people to get from that particular book Un- so I can use it in my presentation. And sexual and dreams? Then, yeah. Okay. What's some of the four things? I would love to pick your brain on that just I, for a second I, so I can make sure You're I touch. looking for the highlight? The highlight. Cliff's Notes version? I, I'd pick three I'd example pick dreams. dreams. One that doesn't look like it's about sex at all, but turns out it is about sex. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. One that looks very sexy and is about sexuality. And one that looks very sexy, but is about a completely different issue in the dreamer's life. I'd pick that and go from there. Because we shouldn't presume just because there is a penis in the dream that it's sexual. It might be what the dreamer thinks about you know, male stuff, power, impotence, potence. It could be all kinds of things. So you, if you take those three examples, people get the idea of that. Then you might take an example that was moving to you about what was revealed and how someone was liberated by understanding a difficult dream, felt liberated, felt freer, let sex be a normal, healthy part of life. Because think about the Middle Ages in Europe. People were just the Inquisition. Sex was everything. Your evilness was whether or not you had sex, rather than whether or not you were honest, whether or not you tortured people, whether or not you had slaves. None of that counted. It was whether or not you had sex with the wrong person. Sex can be way overblown and become the whole focus that hides much more important moral issues in a culture. Does that make sense to you? It makes perfect sense. Okay. Now, one thing I wanted to say about people having their right to interpret their own dream the way they want, of course they have the right. But I would vote for that person taking some time to make sure she's interpreting the dream according to her own descriptions, not according to something her grandmother said or Carl Jung said, because that's not necessarily about her. If, yeah, if she gives you descriptions that look like in a Jungian interpretation, well, then that's what it's about for her. But if she's talking about a cat and she doesn't talk about the feminine principle because she hasn't been brainwashed by the Jungians, if she in fact talks about a cat as a sleek, black, gorgeous, agile character who comes into her bedroom and cats are people who are, are animals who love you when they want to, they're distant and aloof, you know, then that's about something else. That's about her boyfriend. Let that be her reality. But give her time to explore through description what she thinks about the image before she jumps to a conclusion. Oh, I dreamt about a horse. It must be some strong masculine part of myself. Maybe it was a mare, for all we know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, you are right when you were saying in the beginning. Um, what's the word again, Professor, when the dream, it, it is what it is? It is what it is. Um, what's what the word is. for that again? Um, Phenomenological. The, Phenomenological. I see that in you. I see it. You're right. You're yeah, right. You're yeah. right. And I've got to say, Freud said, Freud said he didn't follow it, but he said, look again at the facts, look again and again until they speak to you. That's yep. very cool. And he did that in transference. He, I don't think Freud's best work was his dream work. I think it was much more in the relationship between patient and some of the dynamics and the whole role of sexuality in life. Terribly important. He was talking to a Victorian world that didn't want to talk about anything. He was a very courageous man. And he was Jewish beside. So for a Jew to be talking about sexuality to people who think it doesn't happen, I don't know how we have kids, but it doesn't happen. Very brave man. (laughs) You need to go talk in Japan. They have an population issue. Oh, they do. (laughs) All right, Gail. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. you. Bye-bye, everybody. When I come to San Francisco, I'll visit you. Oh, definitely. I would love that. You have another career in psychology. (laughs) <laughs> interpreting the Caribbean style. And I want to pick up your Caribbean accents. They are so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll bring you out. The next time we're on the class scale, we'll figure out how to bring you out here for a few weeks and put you up in the guest cottage, and then we can do this. And uh, This group is just about to have a, a, an overnight. Oh, gonna I was going to say, how about a pajama party? Basically, a pajama party with a dream-sharing group in the morning. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> Let, we'll let you go. Oh. I'll see you in email. One hint. One hint is tell people to bring their dreams already written out before they come to the overnight. It takes the pressure off of having to remember a dream in a crowd the next morning. There you go. Bring bring along some dreams. Yeah. Godspeed. Thank you so yeah. much. Bye bye, Alex. Bye. Bye bye. Have a good one. Thank you.